as I said before, this is part of a three-part series um, where uh, we will talk about obtaining cohort data. Um, I'm going to uh, not get exactly this cohort in this webinar, but uh, a similar one. You'll see the, the general idea of getting cohort data. Then uh, two weeks from now, we'll talk about uh, running like GBM on uh, that cohort data. And then finally, um, two weeks from then, we will talk about um, we will talk about uh, ranking uh, those features that we're pulling out of like GBM with Chef. So um, that's uh, that's the series that we have planned. Uh, hopefully, you enjoy it. Um, and again, please ask questions uh, in the chat. All right. So first, I'll talk about cohort selection. Uh, this is our coffee break series. They're ten minute webinars. And uh, we will, um, they're 10 minute webinars um, and we'll go ahead and uh, uh, have our coffee. So um, this is an SR500 coffee roaster. I highly suggest checking out roasting your own coffee. The other thing I suggest checking out is uh, DNA Nexus. Uh, so this is where I work. Um, and here we can see um, you can incorporate high quality data uh, build and explore cohorts of interest, uh, conduct rigorous analysis. So basically, um, we allow folks um, uh, to do uh, really rigorous genotype, phenotype, and imaging analysis, uh, as well as combining that type of data um, on the AWS and Azure Cloud. All right, so I'm going to go through this in a demo in a minute, but uh, really one of the coolest things uh, about uh, the DNA Nexus product Apollo uh, is that you can do cohort selection. Obviously, you can do that on the command line. I did it on the command line for many years. I tell you, uh, I really, really prefer this system. It's much, much easier. This is a question I have all the time. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, how many in my data set, uh, how many females between the ages of 60 and 71 have a particular uh, disease, uh, say uh, colon cancer, something like that. Um, great. All right. So, uh, what I'd like to do is just go straight into a demo of how that works. Um, so here I see, uh, the same thing I just showed you, but live. And the nice thing is I can select females again, between 60 and 71. And, um, I can pick a particular disease. So, uh, for example, uh, if I wanted to look um, at a given uh, cancer, um, I could easily look at a given class of cancers. Um, and then I can look at treatments. So uh, for example, if I wanted uh, to look at uh, females between 60 and 73 uh, that had uh, digestive cancers and also took cod liver oil, uh, that is something I could do. Um, and I can refresh the dashboard and see that I've really actually narrowed it down uh, to about four uh, individuals. So uh, if I don't have enough individuals to make a meaningful statistical cohort, um, I can remove one of those filters um, and then I have uh, a number of other filters. Um, of course, for uh, adverse drug reactions, um, I'm gonna be very, very interested um, in what drugs people are taking, what drugs people aren't taking, so on and so forth. Um, and then, uh, as we'll see uh, in the next couple of webinars, um, the nice thing is uh, I can save uh, these cohorts in a snapshot. Um, and then it's also really quite easy uh, to port these data uh, into a Jupyter notebook uh, by using the DX Data API. Uh, if you're a member of the community who is not uh, an Apollo customer, um, this is something that you can. Um, you can do on your own, but uh, there are, of course, challenges launching uh, Jupyter Lab on bare metal cloud. Um, and of course, challenges uh, downloading some of this data. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you about the cohort browser uh, is that actually you also get a lollipop chart of variant frequency. And that can be uh, really, really useful um, in terms of thinking about um, uh, how uh, your cohorts interact with genomic variants. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of this, but very interesting. So again, 
Uh, you can import these things into Jupyter Lab. And then one nice thing uh, I would like to show you uh, is that in addition, um, you can make uh, obviously graphs, but also uh, remove uh, missing data, which is very important uh, when you're uh, defining uh, categorical variables and preparing things uh, for machine learning. So uh, here uh, I'm able to uh, really filter by lots of biological samples uh, and really see what data is there. And, and this is something I've realized lately, there's thousands and thousands of use cases in biomedical data science, but uh, one use case that almost every single bio, biomedical data scientist uh, encounters every day is, is there data to do this experiment? And so um, that's something uh, that's very easy to look at. And so here uh, you can filter uh, by a whole bunch of things um, and uh, grab what you want. So you can do that uh, via the cohort browser, um, also working with phenotypes, and then you can uh, move, um, you can move, remove missing values uh, relatively easily. Um, and that I think is uh, a really nice thing and something that you can work on uh, in collaboration uh, with scientists at DNA Nexus. Uh, so with that, um, we have, um, oh, let me present a couple more slides. Um, so you can also uh, use Spark cluster enabled Jupyter Lab. Um, this is gonna be very important for next time. Uh, to really upload large data files. Um, we'll see that next time when we do the uh, light GBM analysis. Um, and it enables uh, distributed data processing. Uh, that is really a big plus. They're very easy to set up. And I'll show you how to do that next time. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all of the people here um, for helping put together this presentation. And with that, I think we might have time uh, for one or two questions. If you'd like to uh, read a summary of uh, Chow Lin's initial research project uh, starting this, uh, please go ahead um, and check out uh, these Medium posts here. Um, with that, um, I will go ahead and stop sharing and uh, we'll uh, open up the floor uh, for maybe one, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so somebody asked, do you need an active UK biobank application to make use of cohort methods on Apollo? So um, I don't know if you uh, saw the UK biobank symposium. Uh, I believe it was last Thursday, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, so uh, the WGS data and WES data from UK biobank uh, will be hosted on uh, DNA Nexus. And um, so there's two ways that's hosted. One is through uh, an Apollo license. The other one is through the uh, UKB uh, research platform. And so um, if you uh, wanted to use the UKB platform, which will be launched fully to the public this summer, uh, you would need an active uh, UKB application. I would recommend uh, going ahead and starting that process now. Um, if you don't already have an active UKB uh, application. Before I worked at DNA Nexus, um, I myself uh, went through the UKB application process. Um, I think it, uh, it's relatively straightforward, but it does take some time. So uh, the, the most difficult thing is, is really being uh, patient uh, with that. Um, so, so go ahead and apply. Um, if you do have an app active, um, uh, application in UKB, um, you can apply for the early access program. Go ahead and send me a note directly. Um, I'll put you in touch with the right people uh, and, and we can contact UK Biobank. They do ultimately make that decision, not DNA Nexus, just to be clear. Um, uh, so are sample identifiers the same uh, as in UKB? Um, Yes, uh, so uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe sample identifiers are the same as in UKB, but I do not uh, know that for sure. So uh, that is something I'm 
80% sure of that statement. Um, but I believe uh, that is in fact something you could do. Again, uh, in the summer, the UKB uh, research platform, uh, the Apollo browser and the Jupyter notebooks uh, will be available to everyone with a unapproved uh, UKB application. So with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, thanks Reese for saying you like the quick takes and next time uh, we're gonna do light GBM in uh, 10 minutes as well. So uh, hopefully that's fun and useful to you. And then two weeks after that, uh, we'll be going over Shep. So uh, I hope everybody has a great two weeks. Uh, perhaps I'll talk to you before that. Uh, Wayne, send me a note if you like. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll see all of you soon. All right, thanks.